Well, like, the first question I have to ask everybody is, how many people are here because they're part of the Mike Tanner fan club? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it seems like as we walked in the building, everybody was saying, hi, Mike, hi, Mike. So, about the down in the back? Yeah, no, actually, I was interested in this topic. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Ralph. Well. So, uh, so, that's a bonus, Mike. <laughs> Anybody else in the mic tanner fan club? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, a few of them were asking, where's the mic? Oh, <laughs> okay. Anyway, seriously. So we have the topic of our presentation being beyond the guidebook 2010. And the reference to the guidebook is a document called Store and Planning, a guidebook for British Columbia, released in 2002, by I was the uh, project manager and, and principal author. And in terms of the audience today, it's really great to see the uh, stream of dream society here in force. So. Uh, <laughs> Paul, Joan, Louise, right? You do that. Hey, wait, right? Hey, make a small crowd, but we're here to have fun, right? <laughs> how many people, just curious as to what brought you here, how many people are from local government? No, okay. No, okay. Ray, I'm sorry, there's no fan club for you. <laughs> uh, the rest of you, like, you're an architect, so. I'm an architect. Is, yeah. the, is the green stuff that you're here to learn about? And uh, I'd like to hear more about the fan club, but also more about what, like, <laughs> is this how you conduct every meeting? <laughs> so, Where I'm here to, because I'm interested in water. Good. And uh, uh, I don't know if you'll be touching on it, but the National Geographic this summer, or May or July, I don't know if you saw it, was a whole issue on water, it was a very compelling, uh, uh, as only National Geographic can do, and uh, so I'm here to learn more about it well, and, and what we're doing. This is interactive, and you brought it up, so I guess you're going to speak more on National Geographic as we progress. Well, I wish right? I had a <laughs> <laughs> because we are going to try to conduct. I mean, we have some stuff to tell you first to kind of get everybody going, but really, be interactive is the best. And actually. What you provided was a great segue to this Mike Harper quote, mm -hmm. which you know said it at test of time because that's seven years now, seven years almost exactly, and, and really, so when we talk about water management, it's all about the site, isn't it? And, and really, it covers both you know, the water use and the water running off side of things. And really, Mike's key message was it's those little choices. And uh, you know, this, so this is a quote that's really starting to stand the test of time. You know, that just just resonates, which is why we decided to. Uh, use this in all of our Beyond the Guidebook uh, presentations this time around. So in terms of, you know, we are an integrated team, so we're just going to kind of hand off, and uh, I'm going to obviously give you this context for Beyond the Guidebook 2010, and we're just going to talk about need for action. That's our, our mantra. And he'll explain what that means. And then uh, those of you here from Mike Tanner Fan Club, uh, Mike is the chair of the Water Bucket website, which is kind of important. And then an unusual twist, because Ray said, Kim, why don't you wrap it up? I said, no, Mike, you do it. I'd rather Ray do it. So Ray's going to kind of finish off with connecting the dots. That will, that will kind of provide the segue into the into the interactive part. So, beyond the guidebook, this is our story. The photograph of the six chairs. Two of the chairs are here. We set up to do something different because you know guidebooks are kind of technical, but this is a story, people's stories. And you know the significance of, of Mike and, and Ray and the other chairs is that they're the leaders of these partnerships, which are part of this web partnerships. And you can't draw draw diagrams because it kind of all goes like that but it, it works. So, um, you know, a decade ago, this, this, this really was a conscious decision in terms of going a, um, an educational path. But it's kind of, you know, an unknown because, you know, a decade ago there was nothing in the way of policy that really was, was guiding us other than by 2002 we had the Stormwater Guidebook. And so, you know, when you take that educational path, and this is why it's great having the stream of dream society, I love that, right? Um, and the audience is because it takes time the culture. And so we're at a point now, after almost a decade, where we can sort of say, you know what, it works. We can look at what the people in Washington State have done, where we have the same starting point a decade ago, and they went prescriptive, we went educational, and we compare where we are after a decade. And so what we have done, and this is the story, and I sit here, the story of what both governments are accomplishing, but again, because of the NGO factor, a big part of that story is, is, the, is that relationship between people with government and the community because that's the key, is that collaboration, that partnership, and raise to come from that. So this is the table of contents. Um, so this kind of moves you through the document in terms of you know, awareness to action. As you can tell, two out of three of us here are kind of on the older side. 
And so you have to reach a point where talk is not enough and it's all about the action, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's that kind of frame of reference and, and, the, and, and you know, the, the policies that are now in place that are allowing us to do things, we didn't have those policies a decade ago. And then of course the chapter, very short chapter, just putting in context for the guidebook and that leads into changing the culture and, and, and capturing in simple language what it actually means on the ground. And then we just kind of walk away from the document in terms of the Community for Action Program, what, what has made up this outreach and continuing education program for the last decade, getting into the Beyond the Guidebook, the stories, of who's doing what, and, uh, and you know, at the end of the day, it's all about being outcome oriented. So that's why that's highlighted in bold. So when we reflect on where we've come from, and you always judge your progress by how far you've come, and we're able to say, you know, as, as the six chairs and myself, we have the tools and experience to design with nature, and I think you probably can give some examples. And so we see BC being at a tipping point. And is it Don? Don, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this, this is probably why you're here, right? You, even even at lunchtime discussion, you, you, you can kind of see, see the fact that you know, the building industry's kind of got it. We, we're, we're talking about what's happening in the suburbs. And that's why your comments are particularly relevant, Paul, and Joan, and Louise. And so this culture change, which has been taking place, it's within our grasp. That, that's our key message. So in 2002, um, perhaps, Paul, you might be able to relate to what a radical premise that was in 2002, because as the Guidebook Steering Committee, when we said, how are we going to brand what we've done here? And when we talked about it, we said, well, you know, our message is that land development and watershed protection can be compatible. And that was kind of sheer heresy in 2002 to suggest that because think back to where we were in the 90s, coming out of the 90s, and the salmon crisis and all the, you know, the endangered species, the whole bit. Because we're, what we put it down to was we finally had the beginnings of the science-based understandings, which was allowing us to bridge the gap between all this highfalutin language that we had. You know, we've had this highfalutin language for 20 years in terms of fish and community plans, you know, protection of, of fish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the Brundle Commission, what was that, 1992, and all that, her statements got embedded in OCPs. So we had the policy, you know, the site design practices where, they, you know, where you make the change. But what we lacked up to that point was the science-based understanding. And it was only about 1998 when things started to come together from a biological point, and then with point of view rather, and then with our approach to hydrology, we were at that point saying, yeah, you know, we can make a difference, but it's got to take time. In terms of, of, of both the guidebook and beyond the guidebook, this is kind of a critical diagram or image because until a decade ago, people thought in terms of storms, the big storms. And, you know, well, we can't do anything because when it's raining, it's chaos. But when you start looking at the data and look at, you know, the rainfall distribution, and what starts to pop out of it is that, you know, most of the time, it's just drizzle, right? We all know that. And so what we did was we categorized the rainfall spectrum. We said, in a typical year, we get 180 days of rain. But, you know, we only have a handful of extreme events. Most of the volume is falling in those very light showers. And you see here we move away from that engineering-centric language. Light showers, heavy rain, people get that. My wife out there, she's a kindergarten teacher. She said, stop using that. You know, big storm, little storm stuff. Anyway, but you can sort of see the numbers in terms of light showers accounting for 75% of the volume. And it was only a decade ago that people began to realize it was the small rain events that were creating the damage to creeks. And so once you start to get your mind around that you can actually handle the numbers, then that premise about changing practices and achieving and making things compatible starts, starts to uh, make sense. So, the other point here is highlighting the fact that what people think of storm management is really very narrow in scope. And what I find interesting after having graduated in 1973 is that back in 1973, we did not use the word stormwater. When I graduated, when I graduated it was drainage. And stormwater was a mid-1970s mid name. And it was really coined by the pipe guys who were doing the combined sewer overflows in the States. And yet, you know, we had to go through a re-educational process to go from drainage to stormwater. Now we're, I'm getting the hook. Now we're going from stormwater to, to rainwater. Anyway, soil depth. We bring it down to soil depth. Being the water sustainability, because I think back to my original comments about water use, water running off, it all comes back to the soil, whether you have the sponge. I guess, Don, you can probably relate to that in terms of site development, in terms of what you're doing. You've got to have the sponge. If we design with nature, that's our part of our, our, our language, is design with nature. 
and we're engineering this. And so in linking ideas, again, it was only 2006 when in terms of the language we're using because of having to communicate with people in the open and people on the coast saying, what does water sustainability mean? What does green infrastructure mean? Well, they're related because you get to water sustainability through your green infrastructure practices. Because your green infrastructure practices affect you know, the sponge, what you're using in the way of water to, to water things versus what comes on. And as John Finney said, one of the six chairs, it's all about changing the mindset. And that's what the role of all of us in the Convening for Action movement are doing. It's great. It's your turn.